Section 22 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Chapter 5, Milk Fund, Part 6. 4. The 1971 Price Support Decision by the President and Dairy Trust Contributions to the President's Campaign. National attention was first focused on the dairy co-ops in 1971 in connection with the possible link between an unusual presidential reversal in March 1971 of a milk price support decision by the Secretary of Agriculture and substantial dairy trust contributions to the President's re-election campaign. As indicated in this report, the 1971 decision by the President was just one of a series of favorable administration actions on the milk producer's agenda. Likewise, their 1971 contributions were not their only contributions to the President's 1972 re-election campaign, at or about the same time they were seeking favorable action from the administration. The 1971 decision may be significantly different, however, from these other matters. The White Paper demonstrates that the President himself made the decision after he was reminded by a top aide and by Treasury Secretary Connolly of the political contribution activity of the dairy lobby. The dairymen and certain key congressmen had pressed the economic case for a price support increase. The president has conceded that, nonetheless, the economic justification for an increase was not a principal consideration in his decision. Rather, he says he made the decision in light of Democratic congressional pressure to assure himself of the dairymen's support in his upcoming re-election bid. The President's explanation ignores certain key events contemporaneous to his decision, uncovered by the Select Committee, which shed light on the type of support undertaken by the dairymen. Two days passed between the time the President announced his decision to his top aides on the afternoon of March 23rd and the time the increase was announced on March 25th. In the interim, a series of meetings and telephone calls took place, initiated by White House officials, and, at least in the case of the first meeting, at the direction or with the knowledge of the President himself. Although administration and dairy officials deny that there was any quid pro quo expressed, the apparent thrust of this activity was to notify the dairymen that a price support increase announcement was imminent, and to link, at the direction of one of the President's top aides, John Ehrlichman, that announcement to substantial dairy contributions, including the reaffirmation of the $2 million pledge to the President's campaign. The dairymen obliged. Representatives of the lead co-op, AMPI, AMPI, first secured commitments from two other dairy co-ops, MID-AM and DI, this arrangement was confirmed at a late-night meeting on the 24th, arranged by Ehrlichman on the 23rd, and attended by AMPI's leader, Harold Nelson, his attorney, and Nixon associate Murray Chotiner, and the President's personal attorney and chief fundraiser, Herbert Kalmbach. At the meeting, Kalmbach was informed that the reaffirmation of the $2 million pledge had already been made and had been linked to the announcement. The next day, the increase was announced. That $2 million constituted one of the three largest and earliest commitments to the President's re-election campaign, and a full 5% of his projected re-election budget. Moreover, it apparently was promised to be made in monthly installments of $90,000 beginning on April 1, 1971, the effective date of the price increase at a time when the President trailed Senator Muskie by a full five percentage points in a leading presidential poll. In the days and weeks that followed the President's decision, preparations were finally made to begin contributing the first $250,000 committed. While the dairymen widely boasted of the success of their contribution activity in securing the presidential increase, 
usda officials both career employees and political appointees were shocked and demoralized by the fact and the manner of the reversal by the president the discussion of these matters will be presented as follows the decision-making process of the department of agriculture leading to the secretary's march twelfth nineteen seventy one decision not to raise the support level and thereafter until march twenty third when the president reversed the secretary and took steps to raise the support level section four a contacts prior to march twenty third between the milk producers and the department of agriculture members of congress the white house including the president ehrlichman colson and other presidential assistants and treasury secretary connolly sections four b to e the events on march twenty third including several meetings involving the president that took place on that date section four f the events on march twenty fourth including pledges to the president's campaign and meetings arranged by ehrlichman one attended by himself and Kambach, and another by Kambach, Nelson, and Chotiner. Section 4G The March 25th announcement of the President's decision and its aftermath, Section 4H, and an analysis of the White House justification of the President's decision, Section 4I. A the department of agriculture decision-making process prior to march twenty third the department of agriculture was presented with dairy industry arguments that a milk price support level of eighty five or ninety per cent of parity was economically justified none the less after several months of deliberation and review at all levels of the department and other interested agencies all in accordance with the customary and detailed procedures for such matters the secretary of agriculture announced on march twelfth nineteen seventy one that he would maintain the milk price support level for the april first nineteen seventy one to march thirty first nineteen seventy two marketing year at eighty per cent eleven days later on march twenty third the president reversed the secretary's decision and decided to raise price supports to eighty five per cent without any notice to or consultation with some of those in the department normally involved in such determinations one the march twelfth decision the march twelfth nineteen seventy one decision was made pursuant to the statutory framework for the federal milk price support program a statutory background the goal of the federal milk price support program is to assure an adequate supply of milk to accomplish this the secretary of agriculture is directed by statute to establish each year a milk price support level or minimum price which the government assures that dairy farmers shall receive for their milk used in the manufacture of milk products manufacturing milk to assure that milk prices do not fall below that level the federal government through the commodity credit corporation ccc a part of the department of agriculture purchases milk products butter cheese and dry milk in the open market when their prices fall to the support level price by offering to buy at the support price all excess production of manufacturing milk the government thereby maintains milk prices at no lower than the support level in theory such an assured minimum price will call forth sufficient milk production to meet the statutory goal of an adequate supply the statute restricts the price at which the secretary may set the support level the restriction is linked to farmer purchasing power this relationship is known as parity perhaps the simplest definition of parity was provided by the u s d a s chief economist dr don parlberg who essentially defined it as follows if a gallon of milk would buy a pair of overalls in the base period then to be at one hundred per cent of parity the price of a gallon of milk should be enough to buy a pair of overalls now the parity price concept was first recognized by congress in the agricultural adjustment act of nineteen thirty three 
the base period is 1910 to 1914. Under Section 201 of the Agricultural Act of 1949, as amended in 1970, the applicable statute for the 1971 marketing year, the Secretary was permitted to set the support level at no more than 90% and no less than 75% of parity. The support level is announced as a dollar and cents amount for a hundredweight or 100 pounds of whole milk. For example, in March 1970, the year before the controversial decision, the price support level was raised from $4.28 to $4.66 per hundredweight of milk, which was 85% of parity. Section 406 of the 1949 Act requires the Secretary, insofar as practicable, to announce the level of support for milk in advance of the beginning of the marketing year or season. Thereafter, monthly parity prices for milk are computed pursuant to Title Seven of the U.S. Code, Chapter 1301, Section A-1. The price support level may be raised at any time during the marketing year, but once announced, the level of support may not be reduced for the duration of the marketing year. Therefore, the Secretary may decide not to increase price supports at the start of the year, and then, if circumstances change later in the year and warrant an increase, he can grant it at that time. B. Preparation for the March 12th Decision The official recommendation for a price support level usually is drawn by the Livestock and Dairy Division of the Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Service, ASCS, of the Department of Agriculture. Based on economic estimates provided by the Interagency Dairy Estimates Committee and the USDA Department of Agricultural Economics, the ASCS drafts its recommended decision in the form of a docket, which also contains the justification for the recommendation. The docket is then passed up the line before going to the CCC Board of Directors for approval and undergoes pre-board clearance by others in the USDA. If it is approved by the CCC Board, usually with the acquiescence of the Secretary, who is a member of the Board, the recommended decision then goes to the Secretary for final action. The USDA decision-making process, which led to the setting on March 12th of the 1971-72 milk price support level, appears to have been normal in every respect. The process began, as it usually does, a number of months prior to April 1, 1971. On September 25, 1970, Keister Adams, Deputy Director of the Livestock and Dairy Division, wrote a memorandum to Carl Farrington, now deceased, Deputy Administrator of Commodity Operations, recommending keeping the support price level at the $4.66 level established the previous March. In the following months, the Interagency Committee reviewed estimates of milk production and consumption at 75, 80, 85, and 90 percent of parity, and at $4.66 upward in five-cent increments. It was the unanimous feeling of the Committee that the $4.66 support level should be retained for 1971-72. This conclusion is reflected in a memorandum sent to Kenneth Frick, administrator of the ASCS, on January 7, 1971. The reason stated in this memorandum concerned recent increases in milk production and the prospect that an increase in the support level would increase surpluses and costs to the CCC. Dr. Don Parlberg, Director of Agricultural Economics at USDA, and the department's chief economist, was in complete agreement with this recommendation. Dr. Parlberg served at the USDA in the Eisenhower administration, 1953-58, to as assistant to the secretary and as assistant secretary. He was also special assistant to President Eisenhower for economic affairs, with special responsibility in agriculture. In 1971, it was his function as Chief Agricultural Economic Advisor in the Agriculture Department to report to and advise the Board of the CCC and the Secretary of Agriculture 
on actions such as the determination of milk price support levels in their deliberations the experts considered the arguments advanced both by industry and congressional leaders to justify a price support increase on economic grounds by early nineteen seventy one rising costs to farmers including feed costs resulting from a corn blight in nineteen seventy had caused the four dollar and sixty six cent level to fall from eighty five per cent to approximately eighty per cent of parity perhaps endangering farmer income and milk supply however parlberg and others were concerned that since production of dairy products was rising a further increase in the price support level might stimulate production reduce consumption and be excessively costly to the government moreover departmental experts did not believe that a reduction in the parity level necessarily signaled a fall in farmer income Parlberg pointed out to the select committee that greater productivity of dairy farmers experienced in recent years had offset a decrease in parity, so that farmer income remained constant or had risen. In terms of the statute, the Department of Agriculture did not consider an increase necessary to assure an adequate supply. Based on these recommendations and considerations, and after consultation with his superiors, livestock and dairy division director reuben jones and keister adams sidney cohen who had responsibility for preparing the docket did so recommending the four dollar sixty six cent figure and supporting it with a four-page justification the docket was approved by jones kenneth frick administrator of ascs and executive vice president of ccc and the general counsel and budget division of the usda the docket was then ready for ccc board action fully cognizant of the arguments advanced by the dairy co-ops and members of congress in favor of an increase board members including secretary hardin under secretary j phil campbell assistant secretaries clarence palmby and richard ling and frick and parlberg appear to have unanimously favored the four dollar sixty six cent level at its meeting on march third nineteen seventy one the board approved the docket secretary hardin has stated in a sworn affidavit that the march twelfth decision was the subject of major controversy even before it was made the select committee has found no corroboration for this statement with respect to those within the department including the secretary who unanimously favored maintaining the existing price support level under secretary j phil campbell has stated to the select committee staff that to his knowledge there was no major controversy in deciding upon the march twelfth nineteen seventy one price support level further palmby secretary hardin's liaison to the ascs has testified that although secretary hardin may have anguished over the decision palmby was not aware of any substantial controversy within the department of agriculture as to the price support level similarly no other usda employee or official has corroborated hardin's account whatever his anguish hardin opposed an increase on economic grounds dr parlberg a longtime friend and associate of hardin testified that he believed hardin in addition to issuing the march twelfth decision fully supported it this is consistent with the president's own statement that hardin told the president in early march that the price of four dollars and sixty six cents was high enough and should not be raised c the march twelfth decision on march twelfth nineteen seventy one the department announced secretary hardin's decision to retain the price support level at four dollars and sixty six cents in the announcement he noted that some dairymen favored an increase he stated however that in nineteen seventy he had granted the largest increase ever at the beginning of a marketing year and that production had subsequently risen he went on to say after careful review of the situation and the provisions of the law secretary hardin declared that he felt today's action was in the long-term best interests of the dairy producers the long-time well-being of dairymen requires that prices be kept at levels which will permit the overwhelming proportion of milk to clear through commercial markets 
dairymen like all farm producers are faced with increased costs but they know from past experience that they do not benefit when dairy production substantially exceeds demand and excessive surpluses pile up in government warehouses we must avoid this in the same press release, the Secretary also announced two actions favorable to the dairy industry that had been sought by industry leaders. The Department was going to undertake additional purchases of cheese for USDA food programs, by which the market price for milk was expected to be strengthened. In addition, it was announced that the President had directed the Tariff Commission to conduct an immediate investigation of certain cheese imports with a view to limiting foreign competition for domestic cheese. 2. USDA in action from March 12th to March 23rd. The USDA decision-making processes for setting milk price supports in March 1971 ended with the March 12th decision. In fact, except for a few meetings with dairy leaders, no one at the department other than Secretary Hardin and Undersecretary Campbell took any part in reconsideration of the matter between March 12th and March 23rd, when the President made his decision. Assistant Secretary Palmby has sworn that there was no awareness or feeling on his part that the price support level announced on March 12th would be changed, and that he was not aware before March 23rd of any discussions toward raising the price support level at the Department of Agriculture. Palmby summarized his role by stating, I was part of the March 12th announcement. I was not part of the later announcement. In a similar vein, Assistant Secretary Richard Ling has told the Select Committee staff that his first knowledge of the reversal came shortly before the reversal was announced on March 25th, when he was asked to prepare a press release announcing the new level. Ling and Palmby's versions received by the committee in October 1973 and January 1974, directly conflict with Secretary Hardin's previously noted affidavit, in which he stated, During the course of re-evaluating the evidence, I had discussions and advice from members of my staff, including Under Secretary Campbell, Assistant Secretary Ling, and Assistant Secretary Palmby, as late as March 22, 1971, the day before it was reversed, Under Secretary Campbell was publicly backing the March 12th decision. In a speech on that date in State College, Pennsylvania, he emphasized the dangers of overproduction in the milk market. He stated, I must urge dairymen not to be their own worst enemies and push for higher supports at this time. Let's watch the situation carefully for the next few months until we get a clearer picture as to whether a new trend of increased production is becoming established. Parlberg testified that on March 22nd or 23rd, he congratulated Campbell on the speech. Only then did Parlberg receive some inkling of a possible reversal, when, according to Parlberg, Campbell replied, It might not stick. To Parlberg's knowledge, no one at ASCS or in agricultural economics had been consulted between the 12th and that time. All ASCS and other USDA officials and employees interviewed by the select committee corroborated this. In fact, those principally responsible for securing a presidential reversal were affiliated with the milk producers' lobby, certain members of Congress, and ultimately the Treasury Secretary and the White House. End of section twenty two. Recording by Maria Casper. Section twenty three of the Watergate Report, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Chapter 5, Milk Fund, Part 7. B. Milk Producers' Activity, Prior to March 23rd. The milk producers' strategy to secure a price support increase for 1971 was essentially twofold. To try to convince officials at the Department of Agriculture to grant the increase, 
and to enlist the support of Congress in securing an administrative increase. If that failed, to try to secure a legislative increase. As discussed below, the first part of the strategy failed when Secretary Hardin denied any increase on March 12th. The second was partially successful up to a point, but was then abandoned when a presidential increase was secured. 1. Presentations to USDA A. Pre-March 12th According to Mid-AMS official Gary Hanman, the systematic effort by the dairy industry to secure price support increases dated back to at least 1964 or 1965. Those efforts usually included the preparation by industry economists and submission to USDA of economic data supporting an increase. In that regard, the effort for a 1971 increase was no different than in the past. In late 1970, several months before the scheduled decision, economists for the dairy co-ops began preparing an economic presentation in their effort to obtain a price support level at 90 percent of parity. The dairy co-ops also encouraged and supervised an extensive campaign of letter-writing by dairy farmers to the USDA, requesting an increase in price supports. Contributing to these studies in 1971 were PARS staff economists, including Tom Townsend. The document was reviewed and edited by Dr. George Merrin, who had been a consultant to MP after leaving his post as an assistant secretary at the Department of Agriculture in 1968. The principal submission, entitled The Dairy Industry and the Public Interest, The Need for a Price Support Increase, dated February 24, 1971, and signed by Associated Dairymen, an amalgam of the three co-ops, was presented to Secretary Hardin and Undersecretary Campbell by Nelson, Parr, and Hanman in a meeting prior to the March 12th decision. Both in the written document and in their oral briefings of these and other USDA officials, the co-op leaders presented all of their principal economic arguments for an increase, including one based on a rise in feed costs to farmers and a drop in farmer income. As noted above, USDA officials and the Secretary, in his March 12th announcement, took into consideration the arguments relating to increased feed and other farmer costs before deciding that a price increase was not merited. B. March 12th through 23rd. Following the Secretary's March 12th decision, Hanman and others met on March 15th with Secretary Hardin and his staff at USDA, where Hardin defended his decision and stressed what he believed to be the additional cost to the government of the requested increase. Hanman, in his testimony in executive session before the Select Committee on November 13, 1973, acknowledged that the co-ops had already presented to USDA, prior to March 12th, all relevant economic data justifying an increase in their possession, and that there was nothing new to submit in their meeting on the 15th. Hanman said that they tried to prevail upon USDA officials to change their minds. The department officials, fully familiar prior to March 12th with the position and arguments of the dairy co-ops, as well as of members of Congress, apparently were not moved by these industry efforts. In fact, the Select Committee uncovered no evidence of any departmental review of the economic data between the 12th and the 23rd. 2. Efforts to Secure Congressional Support The dairy leaders had, throughout the early months of 1971, also devoted substantial effort to securing congressional support, with the object of bringing pressure to bear on the administration for an administrative increase. The co-op leaders organized letter-writing campaigns of their member farmers to their congressmen or senators, resulting in an outpouring of thousands of letters, urging a 90% price support level. Visits by hundreds of dairy farmers to their congressmen and senators were also arranged. Many of the members of Congress contacted passed their constituents' requests on to the USDA. 
in addition between the end of january and march twenty third the date of the president's decision twenty-nine senators and eighty-eight congressmen expressed their views to the administration by correspondence primarily to the department of agriculture virtually all requesting an increase in the price support level to ninety per cent of parity ampi d i and mid am were the prime movers in these efforts and their leaders took a leading role bob lilly was one of those principally responsible for this effort drawing on his political experience at the state and congressional level lilly helped direct the program of co-op employees and members contacting those members of congress with whom they were familiar prior to march twelfth the principal aim of these contacts was to gain congressional support in convincing the administration to grant an increase on february twelfth nineteen seventy one nelson parr and townsend of ampi met with speaker albert congressman mills and john byrne republican of wisconsin william galbraith u s d a congressional liaison and clark mcgregor counsel to the president for congressional relations in the speaker's office they discussed three or four substantive programs including price supports presumably one of the purposes of the meeting was to indicate to the administration the industry and congressional support for a price support increase speaker albert and congressman mills communicated their views to other administration officials as well connolly testified that he spoke with mills several times about this matter the director of the office of management and budget george schultz told the select committee staff in a november twenty first nineteen seventy three interview that mills contacted him twice prior to march twelfth to argue that an increase would not lead to overproduction according to schultz he received a similar message from speaker albert some time after march twelfth thus the administration was aware prior to march twelfth of congressional support for a price support increase to as much as ninety per cent of parity none the less based on a careful review of the statutory criteria the secretary refused to grant an increase following march twelfth the efforts of the dairy industry on the hill increased between march twelfth and twenty third bills to raise the support level to a minimum of eighty five per cent for one year beginning april first nineteen seventy one were introduced and sponsored by a total of eighty eight congressmen and up to twenty nine senators mostly from farm states two congressmen introduced bills to raise the support level to ninety per cent a more detailed analysis of the extent of such congressional activity is presented below in section four part one before any hearings were held on these bills the president reversed the secretary's march twelfth decision granting the same relief as did most of the pending legislation eighty five per cent for one year in fact as explained in section four part one subheading one d the president's action was more favorable to the industry than was the proposed legislation even before the actual reversal however there is evidence discussed below that ampi because of communications with the white house and other top officials had abandoned its effort to secure legislation and focused its effort to secure an administrative increase from the president before turning to these matters a comment is in order with respect to the milk producers contacts with members of congress the white paper notes that many of the senators and congressmen who supported milk price legislation in nineteen seventy one received contributions from the dairy industry in nineteen seventy two the white house offers no evidence and does not argue that there is any direct connection between the introduction of such legislation and these contributions which were made more than a year after the nineteen seventy one decision and which were publicly filed indeed as the white paper admits the dairy industry also contributed to senate and congressional candidates who did not sponsor such legislation in any event whatever the reasons for congressional contributions either before or after march nineteen seventy one the fundamental questions to which the committee's mandated investigation are addressed remain 
was the president's decision influenced by or made in contemplation of contributions by the dairy industry to his 1972 presidential campaign were the dairy contributions solicited made or received by the president's aides campaign officials and or the dairy lobby for or because of the price support decision if so did the president solicit or accept the dairy contributions with the knowledge that they were made for that reason no matter what the basis for the president's decision c white house involvement prior to march twenty third in the nixon administration there was a standing instruction from the president with respect to any major commodity decision by the department of agriculture such as setting the milk price support level there was to be no final decision without review of the proposed decision by the office of management and budget o m b and the council of economic advisers c e a at least ten days prior to the public announcement in the case of secretary hardin's march twelfth announcement such a review was undertaken in addition top presidential advisers as well as the president himself were involved in the decision-making process both prior to march twelfth and between march twelfth and twenty third one march twelfth decision a o m b and c e a review consistent with the president's rule secretary hardin's proposed decision was forwarded on or about march first nineteen seventy one to dr don rice assistant director of o m b with responsibility for u s d a and several other departments and agencies rice assumes that he received the proposed decision plus supporting material from hardin campbell or palmby rice said that he presumably sent a copy of the material to gary Seavers, his counterpart at cea and now a council member according to rice he wrote a memorandum probably dated march third nineteen seventy one recommending no increase in price supports cea was in agreement apparently schultz asked rice for more information and on march fifth rice wrote a follow-up memorandum in which he strongly supported hardin's position he noted in the memo that hardin and campbell were also in favor of holding the line although hardin was a bit skittish not because of the economic arguments but because of the political pressure being exerted by the co-ops as a result hardin wanted the president himself to approve the decision rice sent copies of his memorandum to ehrlichman and other presidential assistants presumably including john whittaker an aide to ehrlichman with the title of assistant director to the domestic council for natural resources and the environment including agriculture b presidential review on the basis of the evidence gathered by the select committee it appears that the president was consulted and did approve secretary hardin's proposed decision not to raise the support level ehrlichman stated to the select committee staff in a february eighth nineteen seventy four interview that he assumes the president was briefed on the proposed decision ehrlichman explained that's ordinarily the kind of thing that ordinarily he would be told about rice stated that based on several factors he believed that the president approved the proposed decision before it was announced first a cabinet officer's request such as hardin's for a presidential review would ordinarily be honored second two documents identified by the white house indicate direct presidential involvement one from schultz to the president dated march ninth and the other from schultz to the white house staff secretary dated march twentieth reporting on a meeting with the president on march fifth nineteen seventy one with various government officials and covering a wide variety of subjects one of which related to dairy prices the president himself has confirmed that he was directly involved in the first decision in his press conference of november seventeenth nineteen seventy three at the conference of a p managing editors the president stated the method in which the decision was made he said in part i will tell you how it happened i was there 
Cliff Hardin, in the spring of that year, came in and said, The milk support prices are high enough. I said, All right, Cliff, that is your recommendation, the Department of Agriculture? He said, Yes. Apparently, then, as of March 12th, there was unanimous agreement among Secretary Hardin, his entire staff, Director Schultz and his staff, the CEA, and the President, that milk price supports should not be raised in March 1971. 2. March 12th through 23rd. With Hardin, but not the President, publicly committed to no price support increase, AMPI considered that the best chance for an administrative increase lay with the White House and the President. Of significant help to AMPI in contacting top White House officials, such as John Ehrlichman, was Murray Chotiner. A. Murray Chotiner. Murray Chotiner was a longtime friend and political adviser to the President. He became, in 1969, general counsel to the special representative for trade negotiations in the White House, and in January 1970, special counsel to the President. Chotiner stated that in 1970, Harrison introduced some co-op leaders to him, but that they did not discuss any substantive matters or the subject of political contributions with him while he was in the White House. It appears, however, that Chotiner was involved in dairy efforts in the areas of import quotas and price supports while on the White House staff. Nelson believes they discussed one or both matters with Chotiner. Moreover, the Select Committee has received testamentary and documentary evidence that dairy documents on import quotas were circulated to Chotiner in 1970, prior to the President's favorable decision. On March 5, 1971, Chotiner left the White House, and on March 8 became of counsel to Reeves and Harrison, becoming, with Harrison, the milk producer's key representatives to the White House on price supports. At the same time, the firm's annual retainer from AMPI was increased from approximately $40,000 to approximately $108,000, in part to pay Chotiner's salary. In addition, AMPI agreed to pay some of the costs of Chotiner's office furniture and fixtures, Chotiner stated that he spoke to Ehrlichman at the Gridiron Club dinner on March 13th, as well as to Whitaker, Colson, and Cashin between March 12th and 25th. At the same time, Harrison sent letters to Colson and Whitaker. Their message was primarily political. Chotiner told each White House official that the President had to carry the Midwest to win the next election. He added that the farm vote was necessary to carry the Midwest, and that the administration therefore had to do what was necessary to satisfy the farmers. Since the Democrats in Congress were supporting a milk price support increase, he contended that it would be silly for the administration to sit back and let the Democratic Congress take credit for the increase. Harrison wrote a letter, dated March 19th, to Whitaker on the subject of 85% of parity for dairy industry, April 1st, 1971. After some background information, Harrison set forth the following considerations. Economic Considerations This is a political question, and requires a political answer. To more than review economic considerations is dangerous. However, there is no economic problem. USDA's own figures show that total dairy product consumption increased 1.6% during the third quarter of 1970 over the third quarter of 1969, and increased 0.8% in the fourth quarter 1970 over the fourth quarter 1969. USDA's figures show further that consumption dropped in 1968 and 1969, and then dramatically turned around, rising 0.4% in 1970. Thus, the contention that maintaining 85% of parity would result in overproduction and decreased consumption is proved erroneous by the use of USDA's own figures. 
in addition for the past seven years usda's figures have had to be adjusted about six months after their publication the adjustment usually resulting in higher consumption and lower production figures hence the announced increase for the third and fourth quarters of nineteen seventy is very likely actually to be greater when the final figures are analyzed political considerations dairy industry leadership has been very materially assisting the nixon administration tangibly and intangibly farmers voted democratic in nineteen seventy principally on economic grounds since then the administration was beginning to project a more decisively pro-agriculture image to reduce parity now is to undo the good which was being done to reduce parity now and then attempt to increase it effective april first nineteen seventy two is political dynamite because one the purpose would be transparent and two the increase at that time would result in a price increase to consumers which it would not if parity were set at five dollars and five cents for april first nineteen seventy one and continued at five dollars and five cents for april first nineteen seventy two the increase if there is to be one must come or at least must be announced within the next few weeks there is strong democratic support on the hill apparently led by speaker albert to legislate eighty five per cent this may be an attempt to sandbag the president ruining him with dairy farmers if he opposes or vetoes the bill and giving the democrats credit if he signs it or administratively raises parity ironically until march twelfth the dairy industry has gotten from this administration substantially what it wanted though unfortunately always after a vigorous effort the letter concluded conclusion for political if no other reasons parity must again be set at eighty five per cent even if the president has to do it the president's name not the secretary's is on the ballot in a letter to colson harrison assured him that eighty five per cent of parity was except for cheese purchases the last major item the industry will request for some time to come later in march chotiner figured in a key call to nelson and a meeting linking milk producer contributions to the announcement of the president's decision see sections four f and g below b john ehrlichman ehrlichman was the president's chief adviser for domestic affairs ehrlichman stated that whittaker probably brought the price support matter to his attention prior to march twelfth he was as we have already discussed also aware prior to nineteen seventy one of the one hundred thousand dollar political contribution by the milk producers in nineteen sixty nine ehrlichman's dual role as an adviser both on the substantive policy question of the milk price support decision and on campaign activities continued during the march twelfth through twenty third period his discussion with chotiner on milk price supports took place on the thirteenth the previous day the twelfth his logs indicate that he lunched with Kalmbach, and on March 18th, his logs indicate two meetings on campaign spending with several individuals, including John Dean. 1. Meeting on March 19th On March 19th, Ehrlichman held a meeting in his office, attended by Hardin, Schultz, Whitaker, Rice, Cashin, and Richard Cook, a White House congressional liaison to discuss the milk price support decision in the face of industry and congressional pressure for an increase the discussion apparently included reference to contributions and the scheduled march twenty third meeting between the president and dairy leaders a briefing paper for the meeting written by either rice or whittaker had been prepared and distributed ehrlichman stated that whether or not it was mentioned in this document there was a discussion at the meeting of interest group politics and congressional politics although he could not remember anything more specific furthermore according to cashin there may have been some statement at the meeting that if the decision were negative the contributions from the milk producers might not be forthcoming cashin hastened to add in the staff interview 
that no one present at the meeting appeared concerned about the contributions by the nineteenth the meeting between dairy leaders and the president on the twenty third had already been scheduled there was a discussion at the march nineteenth conference of the upcoming meeting whether it should be held and if so what to do in the interim on price supports according to rice it was decided to tough it out at least through the meeting so that the president would be meeting with industry leaders from a position of strength and not of capitulation there the matter ostensibly stood until march twenty third but there is some evidence discussed in the following subsection and in section four d that by the nineteenth several milk producer officials believed that the president would reverse the decision after the meeting on the twenty third two ehrlichman's call to parr the select committee has received testimony from dwight morris that on march eighteenth nineteen seventy one john ehrlichman called david parr morris was at the time secretary of the ampi board and had spent several weeks in washington in march working with parr and others to secure price support legislation morris's testimony concerning a phone call to david parr during that period is set forth in full mr white's now did there come a time when you overheard a telephone conversation between mr parr and someone purportedly from the white house in connection with this effort mr morris yes there did mr white's could you tell us the circumstances of that mr morris well the phone rang and mr parr took up the phone and i think i went into the other room and also picked up the phone mr white's this was in washington in a hotel suite mr morris that's correct and i listened and the man on the other end was saying and i don't know who he was at that time and i still really don't know who it was was saying we want this congressional effort called off mr parr said i can't call it off the man said again the white house wants this congressional effort called off and mr parr then said i can't call it off the man said i don't believe you understood me the president wants this congressional effort called off and mr parr said i don't believe you understood me i can't call it off and then the man from the white house said you've heard of the federal trade commission haven't you mr parr said yes you've heard of the justice department haven't you mr parr said yes and mr parr went on then to say that you just trot them out we'll meet them any time any place you say mr white's and then he hung up mr morris that was mr white's who terminated the conversation who hung up mr morris i think the man from the white house if i'm correct mr white's how did you know it was a man from the white house mr morris that's what mr parr told me later mr white's did he also to the best of your recollection tell you who had called mr morris to the best of my recollection he said it was mr ehrlichman but i at that time i didn't know mr ehrlichman from mr haldeman or mr colson or anybody else but that's the name i think he used now mr parr incidentally does not recall this conversation which i think he's completely honest in because there were hundreds of calls a day into that place and at that time we were talking to the white house several times a day mr morris went on to testify that by the next day friday march nineteenth he understood that the president was going to raise the price support level as a result he said that there was very little effort the following week which began just ten days prior to the start of the new marketing year to work on the hill to secure price support legislation this testimony about a change in strategy after the nineteenth is corroborated by the earlier testimony before the select committee of bob lilly one of the key ampi employees responsible for ampi's legislative effort lilly says that he was very upset over this move not because he thought that the milk producers had sufficient votes in congress 
to both pass price support legislation and override a possible presidential veto he did not think they did instead he felt it was very impolitic and damaging to milk producer congressional relations first to ask members of congress to take a public stand for price support legislation in the face of administrative opposition and then for the co-ops to abandon that effort in midstream and switch to the presidential route nevertheless it appears that after the nineteenth reliance was again placed upon favorable administrative action this time by the president and not the secretary of agriculture End of section 23. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 24 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Section 24. D. Milk Producer Contacts with John Connolly Prior to March 23rd. John Connolly became Secretary of the Treasury in February 1971. As discussed above, Connolly testified that he had been consulted in 1969 at the time of the formation of TAPE. In March 1971, the milk producers turned to him again, this time for his assistance to secure a price support increase. According to Gary Hanman of Mid-Am, the name Connolly was mentioned in milk producer strategy sessions in 1971, since, as he explained, Texas dairy people, particularly AMPI attorney Jake Jacobson, were friendly with Connolly. 1. Contacts by Jake Jacobson Connolly and Jacobson have known each other for 25 years. In 1962, Jacobson was Price Daniels campaign manager in his unsuccessful campaign against Connolly for the governorship of Texas. After the campaign, Jacobson became friends with Connolly, and thereafter the two talked to each other on many occasions. Both Connolly and Jacobson testified that Jacobson talked to Connolly twice about the 1971 price support matter, once before March 12th and once after. Connolly's logs reflect four contacts with Jacobson during the relevant period. A call from Jacobson on February 25th, a meeting among Connolly, Jacobson, and Larry Temple, an Austin lawyer and former Connolly aide, on March 4th, a meeting between Connolly and Jacobson on March 19th, and a call from Jacobson on March 23rd. Connolly remembered the first discussion as occurring at a meeting either in late February or early March, presumably on March 4th. Jacobson stated that at the first meeting he explained the problem to Connolly. When he asked Connolly to use his influence to help the milk producers, Connolly responded that he would try to be helpful. Connolly testified that he interpreted Jacobson's request as one for him to contact Hardin. Connolly says that he was sympathetic to the position of the milk producers, and sometime before the 12th he talked to the president about it. Connolly's logs indicate meetings between Connolly and the President on March 5th and March 12th. The President, in his public statements, has made no reference to any meeting with Connolly before the 12th. Since the President has refused to provide the Select Committee with his logs on this subject, which identify the subject matter of his meetings, it has not been possible to determine the date of the pre-March 12th President Connolly discussion on this question. As discussed in Section 4F, Connolly also, apparently, had several key contacts with the President on March 23rd in connection with the price support matter. 2. Contact with Bob Lilly at Page Airways In the midst of the milk producer efforts in March 1971 to secure an increase, Bob Lilly apparently encountered Connolly in a chance meeting. Although the content and significance of that contact is in dispute, Connolly may have given Lilly an important message on the price support matter. One afternoon in March, Lilly, Nelson, Parr, Tom Townsend, and possibly Lynn Elrod, another AMPI employee, passed Connolly's limousine on their way to Page Airways at Washington National Airport to return home by AMPI's private jet. Lilly, Nelson, Parr, and Townsend each remember seeing Connolly in his car. William Pleasant, Ampy's hired driver, recalls seeing the car and telling his passengers. They, in turn, instructed him to honk and pull alongside, 
and nelson and parr then waved to connolly the ampy party arrived at page and while waiting in the small lobby of page airways terminal to depart saw connolly walking through the lobby according to those ampy people present lily went over to speak to connolly nelson parr and townsend recall that parr tried to follow lily and talk to connolly too but nelson restrained him saying no let bob go bob knows him nelson reasoned that because lily knew connolly far better than any other ampy employees present and parr hardly knew him at all connolly might disclose something to lily that he might not otherwise say in the presence of a stranger according to lily connolly did lily stated that he asked connolly about the chances for an administrative increase in price supports and connolly replied it's in the bag pass it on to the others lily says he assumed connolly had personally spoken to the president lily then returned to his group and told them what connolly said nelson essentially corroborated lily's account and testified that lily had said connolly was optimistic about an increase by the president although lily and nelson said they told the other ampy people there parr townsend and elrod state that they do not remember what was reported to them on lily's discussion with connolly connolly in sworn testimony before the select committee on november fifteenth nineteen seventy three and supplemented by two affidavits stated that he did not recall meeting by chance or otherwise bob lilly or seeing nelson or other ampy people at page airways during march nineteen seventy one he conceded however that it is possible that a chance meeting between himself and ampy people occurred while he was passing through page airways but he denied communicating to any ampy representative any optimism on a reversal of the march twelfth decision in fact he testified that he does not think he discussed the nineteen seventy one price support problem with any ampy representative other than jacobson connolly also denied knowing lilly very well and said that he would recognize parr and nelson ahead of lilly the individuals involved directly disputed that denial and testified that of those present at the time of the page airways meeting lilly knew connolly the best nelson testified that he had met connolly only three times in his life prior to march nineteen seventy one townsend had never met him and parr had been introduced to him perhaps twice in contrast lilly says that as a state lobbyist for the state farm bureau in texas in the nineteen sixties he had frequent contact as often as three or four times a week during state legislative sessions with connolly sometimes in personal meetings of a few persons to discuss state legislation jacobson too acknowledged that lilly had spent a great deal of time at the state capitol in the nineteen sixties lilly's previous contacts with connolly would explain why lilly rather than nelson or parr spoke to connolly about the price support matter at the chance meeting at page airways thus despite connolly's failure to recollect such a meeting it appears that the encounter in fact occurred though additional evidence points to the conclusion that lilly may have been in error as to its date lilly testified that to the best of his recollection this discussion with connolly took place on the afternoon of march nineteenth the day jacobson met for a second time with connolly and ehrlichman met with hardin schultz and others however connolly testified that he did not leave washington on march nineteenth and there is evidence to corroborate that account connolly's logs show an entry for a dinner that evening at eight p m at the blair house in washington given by vice president agnew and the office of the chief of protocol of the department of state informed the committee staff that according to the guest list for the dinner connolly did attend the dinner certain evidence in the possession of the committee points to march fifth as the date of the connolly lilly conversation lilly testified that following the meeting with connolly the ampy people flew home first to little rock for parr townsend and elrod and then to san antonio for nelson and lilly there is an entry in the ampy jet log for a washington little rock san antonio flight on march fifth the only one during that period of significance is the fact that the only time in march that connolly's logs show him at page airways is march fifth at any event connolly did press the milk producer's case to the president and the possible impact of connolly's role upon the president's decision to increase price supports is discussed below e milk producer contribution activity prior to march twenty third 
at the same time in 1971 that the milk producers were attempting to secure an increase in milk price supports, efforts were also underway to make contributions to the president's campaign. Although large commitments had been made, no money had yet been contributed by March 23rd to the president's re-election campaign, and only $10,000 had been contributed to other Republican committees. 1. $2 million commitment. From the time of the meeting in November 1970, in the Madison Hotel, attended by Colson, Kalmbach, Evans, and the AMPI representatives to discuss dummy committees for the $2 million in milk producer contributions, until March 23rd, no substantial progress was made in arranging for these contributions to the President's campaign, and not one penny had been received toward the pledge. In the interim, Colson, Haldeman, and Kalmbach agreed to have a person not directly affiliated with the White House or the campaign to supervise the project. Kalmbach was the chief fundraiser for the president. However, he apparently did not want to deal with interest group contributors, such as the milk producers. In a memorandum from Colson to Haldeman dated February 1, 1971, entitled Outside Fund Handling, Colson pointed out this fact to Haldeman and said that he knew of an individual who could handle contributions from those groups. Haldeman's handwritten response on the menu was, Proceed away. Below that is written Bob Bennett in what has been identified as Colson's handwriting. Robert Bennett has served as Vice Chairman for Public Relations under Robert Mullen in the 1968 campaign when he met Colson and Evans and then became congressional liaison in the Department of Transportation, where he was Colson's political contact. When he left the department in 1970, he joined Mullen's Washington public relations firm. Bennett told the select committee staff that he wanted to participate, albeit in a minor way, in the 1972 campaign. He decided there would be a need for multiple committees for large contributions, and he talked to Colson and Evans about setting up committees. Evans introduced Bennett to Kalmbach, who told him that they needed 100 committees right away, and, ultimately, 300 to 400 committees. In March, Evans gave Bennett a copy of a charter for a District of Columbia committee to work for the renomination of President Richard M. Nixon. In the following months, Bennett organized the committees using that charter. The ultimate disposition of these committees is discussed below in Section 5B. Kalmbach, Bennett, and Evans are all uncertain when these discussions took place, but since John Dean sent copies of a draft of the charter to Kalmbach, Evans, and Frank DeMarco, Kalmbach's law partner, on March 18, 1971, it seems likely that the charter was not given to Bennett until some time afterward. Thus, the re-election effort had not yet received any contributions toward the dairy pledge by March 23rd. 2. Contributions to the March 24, 1971 Republican Dinner The milk producers had apparently made a commitment to a presidential representative, perhaps in addition to the $2 million pledge, to contribute $100,000 to the $1,000 a plate kickoff 1972 Republican Dinner on March 24, sponsored by the Republican Party. Colson, in a memorandum dated February 2, 1971, to Haldeman's aide Lawrence Higby, stated, The milk producers are prepared to buy 10 tables to the committee dinner, $100,000. The National Committee ought to be advised in advance that this is part of the money we owe. The only trick would be to be certain that we got credit for this against the sums they expect us to raise. Both Kalmbach and Gary Hanman of Mid-Am understood that at least part of the milk producers' contributions for the dinner might in fact go to the president's campaign. However, there is no evidence that anyone connected with the dinner or the Republican National Committee was aware of any arrangements between the milk producers and representatives of the president. Moreover, there is no evidence of any transfer of funds from any RNC committee to the president's re-election organization in 1971. In early March, the co-ops were prepared to contribute to and attend the dinner. However, the adverse decision on March 12th dampened their interest and led some dairy leaders to consider a boycott of the dinner and contributions. No action was taken by AMPI toward making the dinner contributions until March 22nd, after Lilly and others began to realize that a price support increase might be granted by the president. 
on that date four tape checks totaling ten thousand dollars were drawn to rnc committees the other two leading co-ops midam and di still had not committed themselves to the dinner or to the president's campaign thus by march twenty third the milk producers may have discussed but except for ten thousand dollars had not yet fulfilled their two million dollar and dinner commitments as discussed in sections f and g these circumstances apparently changed in the following two days on march twenty third the milk producers met with the president and shortly thereafter received word of a possible price support increase on march twenty fourth the milk producers made additional pledges and contributions of seventy five thousand dollars to the republican committees and the earlier two million dollar pledge was reaffirmed in view of the expected announcement of an increase end of section twenty four section twenty five of the watergate report volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org final report of the senate select committee on presidential campaign activities volume two section twenty five f march twenty third the twenty third of march began with a number of dairy industry leaders gathering in washington to meet with the president beginning at nine that morning a number of meetings between administration and milk producer officials took place the president attended a morning meeting with the industry leaders and an afternoon meeting with his advisers at which he announced to his advisers that he would reverse secretary hardin's decision and raise the milk price support level there is evidence in the committee's possession and discussed below that the milk producers were alerted late on the twenty third to a possible price support increase and of the need to reaffirm their two million dollar pledge and within hours they were flying to assemble for a middle-of-the-night rendezvous in an urgent attempt to arrange for commitments of substantial financial contributions by fellow producers to the president's campaign these efforts continued on the twenty fourth as well by the end of which the president's decision had been linked to the dairy contributions one nine a m colson shotner meeting shotner said that he met with colson twice on the twenty third first at nine or nine thirty and later at six in the evening at one or perhaps both of the meetings milk producer political activity and contributions were discussed shotner said that colson was upset with harrison and hillings because of the december nineteen seventy hillings letter to the president and he believes that colson may have even shown him a copy of the letter at one of the two meetings on the twenty third two ten fifteen a m president's call to conley Connolly's logs indicate that the president called Connolly at 10.15 a.m., 15 minutes before the scheduled meeting with the milk producers. That morning, from 8 to 10.05 a.m., Connolly had attended a meeting at the White House with the Republican leadership. Although Connolly did not recall what he discussed with the president during the call, he assumed it related to the prior meeting and not to the upcoming meeting nor to milk price supports. However, materials obtained by the house judiciary committee indicate that connolly did discuss the milk producers with the president three ten thirty a m meeting between the president and milk producers a preparation for the meeting preparations for the march twenty third meeting began several months before on january eleventh nineteen seventy one ampy lawyers harrison and hillings met with secretary hardin and on january fourteenth harrison sent a letter to hardin enclosing a list of names of dairy leaders whom they requested be invited to a meeting at the white house with the president and hardin included in the list were nelson parr butterbrot and others of ampi moser and elagia of d i powell of mid am and harrison and hillings though preparation thus began in january hillings says he hoped to use the opportunity of the meeting to press the milk producers case for price supports the meeting with the dairy leaders appears to have been scheduled substantially further in advance than usual on january twenty sixth hardin forwarded the harrison list to haldeman haldeman says that usually meetings such as this were not put on the president's schedule more than a few days in advance in order to keep it flexible according to a letter from dwight chapin the president's appointment secretary to hardin however the president had as of february twenty fifth already approved of a meeting 
and it had been scheduled for march twenty third at ten thirty a m in the cabinet room b whitaker's briefing paper for the president the president normally receives a briefing paper to assist him in preparing for meetings and john whitaker apparently prepared the presidential briefing paper for the march twenty third meeting as colson had done in his briefing paper to the president the previous september whitaker called the president's attention to milk producer contributions the select committee has been denied access to this document by the president the white house conceded however that in the briefing paper the president was told that the dairy lobby like organized labor had decided to spend political money and that pat hillings and murray Schotner were involved two questions come to mind first how did whitaker learn of this contribution activity second in view of the earlier pledge described in a memorandum from colson to the president what was meant by the phrase the dairy lobby had decided to spend political money first on the same date of the briefing paper march twenty second whitaker received from under secretary campbell a memorandum with a fact sheet on the milk producers and proposed opening remarks by the president for the next day's meeting there was no mention of political contributions according to ehrlichman whitaker did not usually receive fundraising information from kalmbach which was provided to other white house officials on the other hand colson had received the original two million dollar pledge and as indicated by his february nineteen seventy one memos had a continuing interest in milk producer contributions including those to the dinner on the twenty fourth ehrlichman as evidenced by his activity in connection with significant contacts on the twenty third and twenty fourth also became involved in linking the price support increase to dairy contributions second while it appears that both the two million dollar pledge and the march twenty third meeting had their genesis in 1970 the fact remains that as of march twenty third 1971 no money had yet been contributed in satisfaction of that pledge on the contrary certain dairy leaders were even considering a boycott of further contributions to a republican fundraiser that very week the reference in the briefing papers to political money and to two friends of the president hillings and Schotner, at the very least reflect an interest on the part of certain presidential aides in milk producer contributions at a time when the president was considering an important matter affecting the milk producers c the meeting according to the white paper the president opened the meeting by thanking the dairy leaders for the support they had given to administration policies and praised them for their activism in pursuing goals which were important to them the meeting in the cabinet room was taped plaintiffs in nader v butts the suit challenging the legality of the nineteen seventy one price support increase c section six c two a who have a copy of the tape recording of the meeting dispute the white paper's summary plaintiffs have filed a pleading in the case in which they set forth the following transcription of the president's remark i first want to say that i am very grateful for the support that we have had in audible word from this group i know that in american agriculture you're widely recognized that it cuts across all the farmer organizations is represented in all the states i know too that you are a group that are politically very conscious not in any party sense but you realize that what happens in washington not only affects your business success but affects the economy our foreign policy inaudible word affects you and you are willing to do something about it and i must say a lot of businessmen and others i get around this table they yammer and talk a lot but they don't do anything about it but you do and i appreciate that I don't need to spell it out friends talk and others keep me posted as to what you do what did the president mean by his remarks it should be noted that the most recent political activity by the milk producers as of march twenty third was their lobbying efforts on the hill resulting in congressional support for a price support increase which the president has called a gun to our head the question may be asked whether the president was thanking them for this political activity or for expected contribution support it should be recalled one that the president knew of the two million dollar pledge and just prior to the march twenty third meeting he had been reminded by whitaker of the milk producers political contribution activity and two 
that the dairy leaders believed the president was kept informed by Colson of their contribution activity. It appears that the president, who had approved Hardin's March 12 decision and had permitted Hardin to announce it publicly, did not defend the decision at the meeting. He apparently kept his options open and let Hardin and Campbell defend the previous decision. Campbell in particular indicated his concern about overproduction. Schultz said in the staff interview that, in fact, Campbell lectured the dairy leaders on the dangers of overproduction. The white paper states that the president pressed the attendees as to whether or not they could control overproduction. Marin, who was not present, testified that Nelson later told him that he had promised the president that production could be controlled to ensure a market price in excess of $4.93 and thus minimize government surpluses. The producer's position on production differed in two key respects from the approach of the administration. First, the dairymen asserted at the meeting they could control production by instituting certain marketing arrangements, called a base excess plan, on a wide-scale basis, when it may be that the strict implementation of the plan would run afoul of the antitrust laws. In fact, certain aspects of AMPI's base excess plan have been alleged in United States v. Associated Milk Producers Incorporated, Civil Action Number SA 72 c a forty nine WD Texas filed february first, nineteen seventy two, to involve violations of the federal antitrust laws. Second, in a staff interview, Dr. Rice of OMB pointed out that if the dairy farmers could, as they represented, limit production and supply so that the price of milk would be raised by natural market forces to a level in excess of four dollars and ninety three cents, why then did they need a price support increase in the first place? Dairy leader reaction to the meeting was mixed. Butterbrot said that when he left the meeting, he felt the president was going to change his mind. However, Parr was not optimistic and felt their only hope lay with legislation. Hanman, who said the president didn't indicate his position either way, was not encouraged by the meeting. After the meeting, many of the co-op leaders left Washington. Some, including Nelson, Parr, and Hanman, remained, and later that night took part in covert, hurried efforts to arrange substantial commitments for contributions to the president's campaign, after communicating with some administration officials about the likelihood of an imminent price support increase. See sections 4F, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 below. 4. 12 noon. President Schultz and Ehrlichman meeting. Ehrlichman's logs indicate that he met with the president and Schultz at 12 noon, about one half hour after the dairyman meeting ended. The select committee has no evidence indicating the subject of the meeting, and it has been denied access to presidential logs which indicate the subject matter of his meetings. However, in view of their participation in the price support matter, and their attendance at a meeting that afternoon, at 4.45, at which the president presumably announced the reversal to his aides, it is possible that the noon meeting involved, at least in part, a discussion of milk price supports. Moreover, Schultz's assistant, Rice, says he was informed by Schultz of the scheduling of the 445 meeting early that afternoon. 5. 445 p.m. Meeting between the President and his advisors. Late on the afternoon of the 23rd, at approximately 445, the President met with Connolly, Ehrlichman, Schultz, Hardin, Campbell, Whitaker, and Rice to discuss the milk price support situation. Unlike the others present, Connolly, as Treasury Secretary, was not usually involved in milk price support decisions. But he had, as noted above, talked to the President and other officials and was in contact, including on that day, with the milk producers. The Select Committee found that, of those it interviewed, Rice had the most detailed recollection of the positions taken by those present at the meeting. He said that Schultz was still in favor of holding the line, but he was willing to go along with the political experts. According to Rice, Hardin was willing to do whatever the president wanted, and Campbell reluctantly agreed they should grant an increase. Connolly recalled that, on balance, Hardin was still opposed to an increase. In the staff interviews with Hardin and Whitaker, 
white house counsel asserted executive privilege on behalf of the president to prevent them from discussing what was said to or by the president at the afternoon meeting or any other time however hardin said the assertion of the privilege was unnecessary in his case since he did not remember what occurred at the meeting although the white paper notes that rising costs for dairy producers were mentioned it concedes that the economic merits was not one of the two fundamental themes in the meeting which it says were one congressional pressure for an increase and two the political advantages and disadvantages of making a decision regarding a vital political constituency as the white paper makes clear the president's political constituency for the nineteen seventy two campaign moreover rice recalls no sophisticated economic discussion and in fact on the merits hardin and campbell were still opposed to an increase Connolly spoke at length about the political situation the support in congress and the political impact on farm states according to the white paper Connolly said that the dairy industry lobby votes would be important in several midwestern states and he noted that the industry had political funds which would be distributed among house and senate candidates in the coming election year although neither the secretary nor anyone else discussed possible contributions to the president's campaign however the house judiciary committee has indicated that Connolly also stressed the dairy industry's potential for making political contributions since Connolly has denied under oath before the select committee discussing with jacobson or anyone else milk producer contribution activity it is not clear what source Connolly had for his information although campbell does not recall any discussion of a presidential veto the white paper states that the president concluded that he was faced with the option of either vetoing the legislation and losing milk producer support or instead acting to keep the support by increasing the level himself the president chose the second alternative as explained later in this report the presidential increase was more favorable for the milk producers than thirty four of the thirty six bills introduced near the close of the meeting it was decided to inform the dairymen of the president's decision campbell says that someone said well we need to tell the dairymen we are going to raise the support it is not clear what was the purpose of notifying the dairymen what is clear is that in the meetings and calls that immediately followed the meeting and preceded the public announcement two days later and discussed in the following sections the dairymen were informed of the likelihood of an imminent increase and of the need to reaffirm their two million dollar pledge accordingly they attempted to round up contributions and additional pledges and in the end kalmbach was directed by ehrlichman to meet with the dairymen who informed him that the reaffirmation of the two million dollar pledge was linked to the expected announcement six five fifty p m ehrlichman colson meeting it is alleged that near the conclusion of the four forty five meeting with the president there was a brief discussion about someone at the meeting contacting mr colson presumably based on its review of a tape recording of that meeting the house judiciary committee has evidence indicating that the president either directed mr ehrlichman to contact mr colson or approved mr ehrlichman doing so as noted above there was also a discussion of notifying the dairymen of the results of the meeting ehrlichman did contact colson according to his logs ehrlichman met with him at five fifty p m only minutes after the meeting between the president and his aides ended and minutes before colson met with Schotner a principal lawyer for the dairyman seven six p m colson shotner meeting at six that evening shotner met with colson for the second time that day although he could not specifically recall what was discussed at the meeting he believed that at one of his two meetings that day with colson they discussed the hillings letter while shotner denied knowing of the reversal until it was publicly announced on the twenty fifth there is evidence that he knew on the twenty third of the likelihood of an increase in addition to talking to colson on the twenty third shotner reportedly called nelson that day to notify him of the status of the price support matter and to discuss dairy contributions this is further corroborated by subsequent events during that two-day period as testified to by a number of persons including nelson and kalmbach 
End of section 25. Section 26 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Section 26. 8. Schottner Call to Nelson. Nelson has informed the staff that sometime on the 23rd he received a telephone call from Schottner, who told him that the prospects for a price support increase were good, but that it was not certain, and that Nelson was not to count on it. Nelson says that it was clear to him that Schottner had obtained his information from a White House official, perhaps even the President himself. Schottner also discussed contributions, according to Nelson. Schottner is reported to have notified Nelson to attend a meeting on the next night with Kambach and himself to get this matter, the committees for the $2 million pledge, settled. Nelson said, I was to let Kambach know that we were still prepared to make the contribution. While he asserts the increase was not conditioned on the contributions, Nelson says he knew he was expected to reaffirm the pledge. Mr. Sanders, did he indicate to you that the price support decision was linked to this reaffirmation you were to make? Mr. Nelson. No, he just said that he wanted me to meet with Kalmbach, and I suppose that was an implication there, but he didn't deal that bluntly at all. Nelson says that call, and the critical information about the price support decision, and the upcoming meeting with Kalmbach, triggered the trip late that night to Louisville, described below, to secure contribution pledges for the President's campaign from the leaders of Mid-Am and D.I. Before doing so, Nelson also received a call from Under Secretary Campbell. 9. Campbell called to Nelson. Although Nelson does not recall the conversation, it appears that Under Secretary Campbell talked with him by telephone sometime after 5.50 p.m., According to Campbell, the reason for the call was to get the dairy people off our back. Campbell said he asked Nelson, Now, Harold, if we do change our mind and do raise the price, will you and the other dairymen stop asking for price support increases? Because I don't think it is good for the dairymen. Campbell says he concluded by asking, Will you get off our backs? And Nelson agreed. Gary Hanman says he was told on the evening of the 23rd that Campbell had called Parr and told him that progress is being made on the price decision and that they shouldn't boycott a Republican fundraising dinner scheduled for the next evening. There is no evidence of a call from Campbell to Parr that day, and, in any event, Campbell denies discussing the dinner or contributions to the dinner with Parr, Nelson, or anyone else. Also, Campbell did not consider himself to have been designated at the afternoon meeting with the president to notify the dairymen that an increase would be granted, and, in fact, testified that he did not do so in his call to Nelson. Two other dairy representatives in touch with administration officials who attended the 445 presidential meeting, and who were thus in a position to alert the dairy leaders, were Schottner, whose call to Nelson is already outlined above, and Jacobson, who, as described below, was in contact with Connolly. 10. Ehrlichman Kalmbach Call Sometime on the afternoon or evening of the 23rd, Ehrlichman spoke by long-distance telephone with Kalmbach in California. Kalmbach says that at that point Ehrlichman notified Kalmbach of an upcoming meeting scheduled for 11 p.m. on the night of the 24th between Kalmbach and others in Washington. Although Kalmbach did not know at the time of the call, that meeting turned out to be the meeting late on the 24th with Schottner and Nelson, when Kalmbach says he was notified of the link between the price support decision and the $2 million pledge. Of note is that when Ehrlichman spoke to Kalmbach on the 23rd, the purpose of the 11 p.m. meeting and the identity of its participants had not yet been communicated to Kalmbach. Thus, at or about the time the president made his decision and communicated it to his advisers, the effort was underway, but apparently had not been finalized, to involve the president's chief fundraiser in the arrangement for the anticipated $2 million in contributions prior to the public announcement of a price support increase. What yet remained was the dairy lobby's effort to aggregate its political contribution resources prior to that public announcement. 
a matter discussed at the meeting at the louisville airport on the night of the twenty third before that there was at least one additional contact that day between the administration and the dairymen a call from jacobson to connolly eleven jacobson called to connolly it is not entirely clear what role was played by connolly in the milk producer efforts to arrange for contributions linked to the price support decision ehrlichman says he talked to connolly about the price support question either before or after the twelfth as discussed above it is also known that jacobson met with connolly on the nineteenth and contacted connolly by telephone sometime on the afternoon or evening of the twenty third both jacobson and connolly testified that on these occasions they probably discussed price supports but connolly flatly denies there was any mention by jacobson of dairy contributions jacobson however is not so certain he testified that he did not recall but may have discussed milk producer contributions with connolly the most extensive account of connolly's involvement is provided by bob lilly who testified to a significant meeting in the madison hotel shortly after one of these jacobson connolly contacts according to lilly's testimony to the committee on november fourteenth and sixteenth nineteen seventy three nelson parr jacobson harrison and he discussed in late march nineteen seventy one the prospects for a price support increase lilly said that the discussion then turned to political contributions and their outstanding commitments to the president on that point jacobson based on his contact with connolly is said to have reported that in order to obtain mr connolly's assistance in obtaining a favorable decision by the administration with regard to milk price supports new money should be committed by ampi it is lilly's testimony that jacobson strongly indicated it in fact he said this had to be done a discussion ensued and as described by lilly it was agreed that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in new money in addition to whatever milk producer commitments were then outstanding would be committed the other alleged participants deny lilly's account although they agree that there were discussions from time to time about substantial contributions to the president's campaign according to jacobson in the millions nelson does not preclude the possibility that he even may have suggested at one point that they make a contribution immediately as a good faith showing of their intentions to honor their commitment connolly has denied under oath not only discussing with jacobson the milk producer contributions to the president but also knowing of any milk producer contribution activity at no time to this good day do i know nor has anyone ever told me what they contributed to whom or by what means or in what amount i had nothing to do with their political campaign contribution activities i never discussed political contributions by this group with them or with him or with anybody else connolly's dairy contact jacobson has admitted being present during discussions by dairy leaders of contributions mr whites at this time when you presumably reported back to mr nelson and mr parr about your meeting with mr connolly did you discuss political support or political contributions with them to the republican party mr jacobson well i don't recall if it was at that time or some other time but they did a lot of talking about making substantial contributions to the nixon administration mr weitz did they indicate any specific amounts mr jacobson oh the figures were in the millions mr weitz in the millions mr jacobson yes however jacobson stated that he did not know of the purpose of the contributions or of any express tie between the contributions and the price support matter mr weitz exactly what did you know about the contribution to the multiple committees in nineteen seventy one by the dairy people mr jacobson only that they were going to be made mr weitz did you know for what purpose mr jacobson no mr weitz do you know whether there were any commitments made in march of nineteen seventy one by the dairy people to either republican fundraisers or anyone in the administration that such contributions would be made mr jacobson no i don't mr weitz such commitments could have been made though since you were not advised of all of their efforts 
Mr. Jacobson. Absolutely. Mr. Weitz. At any time after the price support decision in 1971, the second one to increase supports, has anyone, other than what you have read in the paper, ever talked to you or have you ever learned about any understanding or commitment for contributions by the dairy people in the hope of obtaining an increase or in fact in the expectation of obtaining an increase mr jacobson no i don't know that mr weitz have you ever discussed this matter with mr parr or mr nelson since march nineteen seventy one the matter of political contributions and milk price support decisions Mr. Jacobson. No. Mr. Weitz. To the present time? Mr. Jacobson. I don't think so. Mr. Dorson. Do you know whether the second increase decision was handled in any way other than the normal procedure that was customarily followed by the Department of Agriculture in the White House? Mr. Jacobson. No, I don't know. On the other hand, Jacobson assumed that the dairy contributions and the efforts to gain favorable action were related. Mr. Dash. Was it necessary to express it? You all were working in the same direction. Was it an understanding that you all had that such a contribution would be aimed in the direction of getting a beneficial result? Mr. Jacobson. Mr. Dash, I would have to assume that would be right. There are several pieces of independent evidence that tend to indicate that Connolly, in fact, was aware, at least in a general way, of the milk producer's contribution activity. First, Haldeman stated that sometime in early 1971, before milk producer contributions to the president were made, but after Haldeman says he became aware of their contributions' intentions, Connolly informed him that the milk producers wanted to make a contribution, but that committees were not being set up for them. Second, according to a transcript released by the House Judiciary Committee of a tape recording of the afternoon meeting with the President on March 23rd, Connolly discussed milk producer contributions with the President and a number of his aides at that meeting. Third, there is a contemporaneous document handwritten by Nelson on the back of a co-op document relating to the 1971 price support matter which bears on the question of Connolly's involvement. Nelson says that the word just below the first line in the middle of the note appears to him to be Connolly. While Nelson said, I just can't tell what the word is, he did acknowledge, I would agree with you that I can see how it could be. Moreover, he was able to name specifically only Connolly and Hardin, who he was aware had spoken to Schultz and the President, and of those two he could not read the word other than as Connolly. Nelson assumed that the note was written on March 23rd at his meeting with the President. The note appears to reflect the substance of two meetings on conversations. While the President and Schultz did attend the morning meeting, Connolly did not. The question may be asked whether the two parts of the note were written on two different occasions, and whether at least the second half reflects a communication between the milk producers and Connolly in connection with the events on March 23rd. Indeed, the language quoted in the first half of the note is nearly identical to that used by Connolly when he testified before the select committee about Schultz's pre-March 23rd position on price supports. As to the meaning of the note, Nelson acknowledged that AMPI was the most aggressive political organization in agriculture. He did not believe don't give referred to contributions because he assumed the note was written after some money had already been contributed. Nelson noted that the didn't give part connotes presently to me that what I was reacting to was the thought that Schultz was not giving in so far as changing his position in the matters concerned, but observed that this is just conjecture on Nelson's part. However, Nelson could only point to the $10,000 in checks that had been prepared on March 22nd for dinner tickets. In any event, that $10,000 fell far short of the alleged $100,000 commitment for the dinner and a $2 million pledge for the president's campaign. In that context, perhaps a contribution of $10,000 wasn't giving. Fourth, Lilly's account of a $250,000 commitment in connection with Jacobson's contact with Connolly dovetails with the evidence that at about that time Kalmbach and Robert Bennett 
both understood that the first contributions by the milk producers to the multiple committees for the president's campaign were to total two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the form of two thousand five hundred dollars to each of one hundred committees finally within thirty-six hours after jacobson called connolly several unusual meetings took place concerning the milk price support decision and substantial contributions and linking in one case connolly and in another ehrlichman to these efforts based on the evidence provided by lilly kalmbach and others these subsequent meetings appear to have resulted from the earlier contacts on march twenty third with connolly Schotner, ehrlichman and perhaps others we now turn to one of the most important of these meetings at the louisville airport late on the night of the twenty third or early in the morning of the twenty fourth twelve late night meeting in louisville late on the night of the twenty third several ampi and mid am people flew from louisville to meet with a d i officer and seek a contribution from d i space of several hundred thousand dollars the meeting was a direct result of the events earlier that day principally their learning of the expected announcement of a price support increase paul alagia was in march nineteen seventy one in the process of stepping down from his position as a top official of di in favor of ben morgan nevertheless together with john moser di's president he had attended the meeting with the president on the twenty third following that meeting he had lunch in washington d c and then flew to chicago on other business while in chicago that evening he received a call from his wife in louisville who told him that some ampi people had called her and were looking for him and wanted to know the time of his scheduled return after another phone call between ampi people and his wife she called elijah and told him that they would be waiting for him in louisville elijah arrived about three or four in the morning to find waiting in the near deserted louisville airport four representatives of the other two major dairy co-ops nelson parr and lilly of ampi and gary hanman of di according to elijah they told him they wanted elijah to commit two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars elijah said of the request it was in the context of the meeting with the president elijah testified that they were trying to pressure him into agreeing to a commitment they told him they had either been to see connolly or they were on their way to see secretary connolly as related to elijah nelson then told him what a forceful fellow connolly was lilly says that the only reason nelson had asked lilly to accompany them to louisville was that since elijah respected lilly who had spoken face to face with connolly about the matter in the page airways terminal nelson hoped that lilly's presence would add greater force to their appeal to elijah elijah says that he refused the first request and that they immediately scaled down their request to a one hundred thousand dollar loan from d i s political arm space to adept by the first of the week march twenty ninth elijah says that he told them he didn't think space could legally loan money and that he wasn't interested in doing so according to elijah the meeting broke off without any understanding that space would make a contribution except for hanman the others present either corroborated or did not dispute the essential portions of elijah's account hanman who first testified before the committee learned of the louisville meeting and did not himself refer to that meeting stated that the only time between march twelfth and twenty fifth that adept contributions to the president may have been discussed was on march twenty fourth at the republican fundraising dinner the next day the twenty fourth space contributed twenty five thousand dollars its largest contribution up to that time to five republican committees and within one week arrangements were under way for tape to loan adept fifty thousand dollars which adept contributed to republican committees these matters are discussed below lilly who says they needed some money from elijah and d i the next day the twenty fourth considered the flight to louisville the first effort by the three dairy trusts of which he was aware to coordinate substantial contributions to the president's campaign parr testified there was some urgency about the trip to louisville but he was not sure why why indeed the price support question and according to ampi a pledge of contributions had been outstanding for several months that very day the twenty third elijah had been in washington with parr and nelson at the meeting with the president 
a meeting for representatives of the three co-ops including parr hanman and elijah was already scheduled for chicago for march twenty fifth what was it that was not known at noon on the twenty third but couldn't wait until march twenty fifth and caused the four instead to fly hundreds of miles in the middle of the night of march twenty third to twenty fourth nelson the head of the leading cooperative provides an explanation nelson says that he acted on the basis of the information he received from schotner about the status of the price support matter and the upcoming meeting with kalmbach he thought by holding out to other dairy leaders the possibility of a presidential increase without assurance that it would definitely be granted he hoped to induce them finally to commit large amounts of money to the president's campaign before the price support matter was resolved End of section 26